So off late, I felt that whenever I've thought of an idea or even have had a specific conversation about a product or anything with a friend, YouTube has just magically recommended me the exact same videos that I've been thinking about or suddenly out of nowhere, I've been just flushed with ads of that specific product or even the idea that I have been speaking about with a bunch of my friends. This really got me thinking about what the Sapiens author Yuval Noah Harari talks about that humans are essentially hackable beings. And he says that there will come a point when technology will start to understand humans better than humans understand themselves. And this was precisely what was happening over here. Tech and ads understood me better than I understood myself. And that's why they knew exactly what I would be interested in at that exact moment. And they just fed me that, which was pretty unique. So in this video, I thought that I'll share three key takeaways that I recently learned from an interview of Tristan Harris with David Fuller in which he talks about can truth in fact survive tech. For those who may not know, Tristan Harris was a former design ethicist at Google and I've talked about Tristan in a bunch of my previous videos, but really he was a design ethicist at Google. He made a 150 slide presentation and circulated it in, in Google saying that Google has a big responsibility towards preserving the attention of the people and not just flooding them with interruptions. And after that, he left it in 2016 and started his own nonprofit and ever since has been a critic of big tech and has also talked about why and how we can preserve our attention. So let's get right to it. The first lesson that I really learned was that technology is really the only sense-making institution and device that we have with us, especially during these times. And therefore it becomes extremely important for us to think about how technology is fundamentally changing us. And Kristen says that Technology has become the sense-making instrument for 3 billion people. And I think that that's never been more true in a coronavirus era. Because with many of us stuck at home, we are peering through the glasses, the telescope of social media to understand what's happening in the world. And when we think about it, it's really true because the 21st century infrastructure is actually tech, which is in fact embedded in our nervous system unlike the physical infrastructure of the 20th century, which is rails and roads and cars, which are actually not embedded in our nervous system. And the way Tristan talks about it is that tech is literally guiding our lives. It's not the other way around. We wake up, we look at our phone, and then we continue with our day. It's not the other way around. When we wake up, we continue with our day, and phone and tech then enters. For a lot of people in the world, the, the former is true, not the latter. And that is what the problem is because our attention is a finite commodity. It's a finite resource. And at the point of which tech can totally overtake that and really manipulate us by understanding ourselves better than we ever will, that opens up opportunities for subtle forms of attention exploitation, which is a term that he often uses in his speeches, articles, and ideas. So yes, the first lesson is that tech is the only sense-making institution that we have with us during these times. So it's extremely important for us to think about how tech is changing us and to critically evaluate whether the change that we are undergoing is something that is ethical, right, and in fact beneficial for us. I could go into talking about the addictions of tech, but really that's not the point of the video. The point of the video is to just talk about and share ideas and really leave ourselves with questions about what we can do with this understanding of how tech is changing us, especially during these times. The second lesson that I really learned from the interview was that our collective attention has a finite carrying capacity, which is far less than the amount of information that actually exists today. And Tristan says that we think of attention as an infinite quantity because if we can condition people to multitask on two things at once, we have actually doubled the amount of attention available to us. But that's actually not the case because it's really hard to multitask on two different things and give your full attention to each thing. We might think that we're able to do that, but really that's not the case. So that brings us to the first point that attention has a finite carrying capacity, both individual and collective. If I, as a YouTuber, don't get your attention, then someone else will. And if someone else doesn't, then yet another person will. 
And so for your attention, so many people are just fighting to just get that slot in your attention, which means that your attention is by far the most valuable commodity that you possess. And so we see things like clickbait and things people do to get more views or more likes and so on and so forth. And all of that is great for the people who are actually creating the content, but it might not be great for someone whose attention is limited, scarce, finite, and extremely valuable. So really, the intention of making these videos for me is not to get more views. While it would be great to have more views and more people see the message that I'm talking about, but the idea is to really share what I've learned and in the process, build a community which will also allow me to learn a bunch of different things. And this in particular was something that really struck me because at the point of which all these social media platforms are competing for our attention in some form or the other, knowing this has helped me filter only those things that I want to give my attention to and not let my attention be taken away. So the second lesson is that attention is a finite quantity a finite commodity. All these players in tech and on social media and influencers are trying to get your attention. Therefore, it becomes extremely important for you to take care of your attention and not let it dissipate. And one interesting filter that I've recently thought of is whenever you log on to YouTube, it'll be nice to see whether you are just clicking on the recommended videos or whether you have a specific intention with which you log on to YouTube. Is there something that you actively want to learn about or want to watch a video on? If that is the case, then, well, you are actually dictating and guiding tech. If that is not the case, then, you know, as Harari says, we are hackable beings. We're essentially being hacked by super efficient and super smart algorithms that, that may not actually work for us in the long run. And the third lesson that I really learned from the interview was that there's a difference between freedom of speech and freedom of reach. And Kristen talks about the idea that traditionally all media platforms used to control and create content, which was valuable, which was credible, and which could also reach a lot of people. But as YouTube and all these platforms progressed, there's been a sudden rise of individuals as media channels themselves. The fact that I'm creating this video, the fact that I have a podcast, the fact that all of us can literally create anything that we want, which is just a button away, means that we are creating a lot more content, but the fact still remains that there are equal, if not fewer, consumers for that same amount of content. And so the question becomes as to what should get amplified? What should YouTube recommend? And on what basis? What are those criteria? Are those criteria going to be videos or the content that you watch that will be divisive? that will be polarizing, or that will be affirming, or that will be reaffirming, or could it be fake news? If a lot of people are watching the same thing, does that mean that that video, that piece of article should actually be amplified by the algorithms or not? And this is the question of freedom of speech versus freedom of reach. And to think about what really should be amplified in contrast to what can be said. People. And I understand that there's no clear answer, but really watching that interview, which I highly recommend doing so, just got me thinking about all these little things and, and helped me form my view about how can we navigate, even as digital consumers of the 21st century, the subtle balance between what content is created and what content is amplified. And therefore the distinction between freedom of speech and freedom of reach. So these were the three quick lessons that I learned from this extremely valuable interview. Tristan Harris is someone who I really admire for his work, for his work ethic, and for the message that he stands for. And I think that at the point of which tech has started to capture our attention in ways that we don't know, it will be useful to think about what are the ethical ways that tech should capture our attention in. I think it'll be extremely useful to have these frameworks, models, and ideas fixed in our own heads before we just are hacked by tech around us. Thank you.